In today's episode, I will show you how to achieve the true heir of Timur achievement. In EU4 Wiki, it's listed in the section designated for the most difficult achievements. And indeed, five years ago, it was quite a challenging achievement to obtain. I even threw a mouse out the window while trying to get it. However, today, no. no. Hello, Imperialist. Lucas here. Timur is that big red blob on the map and we have to start the game as one of his five vassals. Most players usually prefer Transoxiana, and it's not surprising at all. It has quite strong military ideas right from the start of the game, and it's large with access to a pretty good trade node. However, I was asked by my viewer to play this campaign as Afghanistan, and okay, I will play as Afghanistan because why not? Even though it has definitely the weakest starting ideas among the initial countries, even Sistan is better. My personal favorite is Fars because they are located in the best trade node for collecting all the trade from India, which is Hormuz. I will be attempting the achievement on the normal difficulty level since most of you are playing on this level as well. Of course, Iron Man. I hope it succeeds on the first try. And if you want me to prepare another achievement guide after watching this material, whether it's a newer or older one, let me know in the comments. Now let's talk about Afghanistan. For the perfect start with this country, we need a few factors. Firstly, the possibility to recruit a diplomatic reputation advisor. Secondly, Mamluks and Timur must see each other as rivals, which is quite common, but sometimes they don't. These two factors will allow us to quickly ally Mamluks with their support for our independence. And once we have achieved independence, waging war against Timur won't be a problem at all. Another crucial aspect is hiring mercenaries. Many of you underestimate them. We want this campaign to have two, three siege pips. And remember, Paradox has somehow changed the order of these pips. It's worth paying attention to. I keep catching myself looking at the shock value and thinking, great, three for sieging. No, we have two pips for sieging. I don't know why Paradox made this change for mercenaries, but they did. And from what I see, Unfortunately, I only have this one campaign with two siege pips because I can't recruit them within the borders of my country. Sad! Afghanistan also has a unique form of government. Here we can choose from several different options. At the beginning, we definitely want to have lenient taxation, which gives us a diplomatic reputation plus one. Then I'll probably focus on taxation. Generally, focusing on taxation will provide us with a substantial income. I'm hiring a diplomatic advisor. At this point, we can already gain Mamluk's support for our independence aspirations some national decision. We click on it. Why not? I also form an alliance with Transoxiana. It will be very useful for us. Unfortunately, all the other vassals of Timur in the region are quite loyal for now. Now let's focus on the estates, as there will be quite a bit of work here. But step by step, for the Ulema, I'll take the administrative monarchy points. I forgot about the religious diplomats, that we still have diplomatic reputation here. So, no, we don't need advisors right now. However, we do need to invite the right scholar. You guessed it. I want to focus on reducing aggressive expansion. I want to make sure it is active in our country, we will prioritize the development of temples. Having the loyalty of the ulama is crucial to me. During this campaign, we will only develop provinces when we embrace institutions. I'm also taking the clerical minister's policy to increase our monastic order's loyalty. At 100 point, it gives us powerful bonuses, especially in terms of additional taxes and manpower in our provinces. Although it's possible that I might occasionally go for mysticism to reduce idea costs, I'm not entirely sure about that yet. Also remember that when you have 75 piety or minus 75, you can reduce corruption by two or gain extra manpower. I won't take the military point from the emirs because I don't want to go below 20% crown land. Having supremacy over the crown is essential. Prestige will be crucial in this campaign and I want to slow down the decrease in prestige. An additional chance of getting a general is always welcome. Improving the loyalty of the emirs is essential. I won't take the point from the merchants. Instead, I'll take prestige. It's a must-have. Why? Because prestige reduces the aggressive expansion we gain by 10% for every 100 points. Besides, it provides us with improved relations and various other great bonuses. I'll also take loans right away. Yes, I'll roll for a chance to get a cheaper administrative advisor. There's a good chance that I can finance the early game with these cheaper loans. Additional tax income will come in handy. This privilege can be super important for us. We have reduced costs for regular loans and a few other interesting benefits. For the Dimi, grant Dimi liberties to strengthen their state. In general, I want to keep it at 60, 60 as long as possible. That's why I might also take development of communities for speeding up our country's reforms. I'll leave space for other privileges that will appear once we have provinces with non-Muslims. So with all these religions, as you know, the majority of India follows Hinduism. Sunnism is only spreading here. Then I do the standard trick for cheaper advisors, but I got a cheaper military advisor. Too bad. I was hoping for an administrative one. Now I cancel the entire recruitment, of course. As a result, we get an advisor. And an event pops up informing us that if this ruler dies, and he is quite old, all countries that 
that our vassals of Tima will get a significant increase in liberty desire. Finally, I revoke the land. Yes, you noticed correctly I didn't sell it. That's because we'll be in constant warfare as Afghanistan, non-stop. And when we're at war, we lose the peace modifier, which affects autonomy. And when we have less than 20 crown land, we get a minus 10 autonomy. So in that case, it would reset to zero. Okay, I got the following general. Not bad, three shock, one siege. I'd prefer at least two points in this situation. So for now, I'm hiring only and exclusively the free company. I'm sending the first available diplomat to fabricate territorial claims on Kashmir because I want to have a clear path here right after the war with Timur so that I can reach Delhi, alternatively to border with Sirhind because then we can involve Delhi in the war too as Sirhind is a vassal of Delhi. I also immediately complete missions for better troops and preparations for war. Oh, and I think it gave me the right territorial claims. Oh no, I have a bit of bad luck. Timur has two alliances. Usually he had only one in my test games. All right, let's go. And since we're already at war with Timur, we can complete another mission. Actually, because of the stability hit, I think you already figured it out why I didn't choose cheaper advisors. But at the same time, I have a stroke of luck. Timur's ruler dies very quickly. As a result, those nations should soon become extremely disloyal and stop supporting him. Impossible. Is Transoxiana managing well in battles? Very interesting. Delhi is at war with Sir Hind, where Sir Hind managed to break free without any support. I must admit, a lot depends on this war. I would say even more than in our war with Timur. A tough choice. Do we need a quick reform? I think not. All right, let's take military points. Najid is quickly withdrawing from the war, mainly for war reparations. Now that Najd has exited the war, you can see that Mameluk is quickly advancing from the other side into Timur's territory. No, Timur, keep your fingers crossed. I don't want to lose this battle. And fortunately, it seems like I won't lose it. Baluchistan's capital has fallen in defense. Let's set up a trap by scorched earth tactics and withdraw from that province. Now, in the next wars, Baluchistan will receive a minus two penalty while fighting on their own fort. And after such a defeat, we will receive a considerable amount of money from them. To achieve independence, we need 23 points. Well, but we have to wait for that. Because now Timur is attacking my forts. And that's great, because we will crush their army in the next battles. Although I don't have a penalty here. This fort is useless. I could have taken their capital. I was absolutely convinced that this is a mountain province. I'll take a risk. I'm attacking Timur's capital with my army. Especially since there are a lot of allied troops around here as well. Great, we did it. There's no point in prolonging this war. We have money, we have war reparations, and we are free. I can't take much in this war. I mean, I can, because I can take a province. But they would give me quite a lot of aggressive expansion. In fact, if I were to take all the provinces I have territorial claims on, I would have 30 points of aggressive expansion. For this region, it's a significant amount. That's why, in a few years, I'll wage a second war with Timur, in which I will reclaim all these green provinces for Afghanistan. Regardless, I will weaken Timur economically as well. Now let's go step by step. Certainly our rival must be Kashmir because it serves as a gateway to India. I will quickly improve stability by one point. I declare war to occupy those provinces. As for our allies, we have two options. We can either break the alliance with Mamluks now and try to form an alliance with the Ottomans, which might be challenging, or we can stick with the Mamluks for now until they get involved in a war with the Ottomans. On the current patches, I notice that the Ottomans attack the Mamluks very late, and I'm not sure why. We will take advantage of this situation as much as possible. Oh no, I must have made a mistake during the previous peace agreement. Oops! Unfortunately, the war outcome was not favorable. Sirhind won the war and formed Delhi. This is bad news and will significantly slow down our progress. Well, it happens. I'll manage somehow. I have a new heir. Not the best, but it'll do. Since I'm slightly positive on prestige, I'll hire the advisor with yearly prestige plus one. I'll also improve relations with Jaunpur because unfortunately, Delhi entered into a very troublesome alliance. We'll end the war with Guga, taking only their money. Although I must admit, it would be a nice idea to make them a vassal and into integrate and develop that province with gold. But maybe I'll just conquer it in five years. And here's an opportunity. Delhi has attacked Kashmir, so it would be nice to vassalize Kashmir to drag Delhi into a war. Delhi would be in an offensive war while we would be in a defensive one. And then Mamluks will help us. But again, we will regain a province from them, for which we will pay a considerable amount of aggressive expansion. But you know what? I have an idea. I will conquer these two provinces and make Kashmir my vassal. This will trigger a war with Delhi, to which I will call Mamluks. Unfortunately, Delhi also has the fourth technology level because it is currently Delhi formed from Sirhin. As a result, they have an overpowered ruler with stats 4542. Plus, he has very good attributes. We focus solely on developing the province of Kashmir, which we can also immediately add to the trade company. I already have a general with better siege abilities, so I'm recruiting a mercenary army. All right, we're going to crush Delhi's forces on this fort. As you can see, I had to recruit a large number of troops, which resulted in some losses, but it's
it's expected in such a war. Moreover, Mamluks seem to be unresponsive or inactive during the conflict. Here, I noticed that the AI is doing something very stupid. It's attacking my fort in ROH and starting a siege. But all I need to do is move a part of my army from the siege of Lahore to a neighboring province. Then, Delhi withdraws its troops from ROH and attempts to attack my small army next to my main one. So when Delhi's forces get close, I simply engage my entire army. Yes, the land here was scorched. Look, Delhi retreats immediately. I move to the neighboring province and Delhi comes at me again. So. You have a 500 IQ tactic and it repeats. Moreover, I will attempt to intercept those thousand troops. Here's what I do. I select my army and use the shift key to make them move towards the enemy fort. Okay, I had to take the passage from Kwara Kunjulu. Now the Mamluks are on the move and coming towards us. Lahore fell. This is a crucial fort for us. So before I move from here, I'll wait for the fort's manpower to replenish and then I'll burn down the province. Now that we can immediately strike the capital. But perhaps we should attack the Delhi army first. Thanks to our fort, we will have a significant advantage in the battle. Just to be sure, I hired a morale advisor. Easy. Oh great, what a lovely gift from Delhi. Freshly recruited mercenaries. Here we go again, breaking the Delhi army. And why am I inflicting such heavy losses on them? Because I have the upper hand when it comes to my army's line, causing more damage on the flanks. All right, the Mamluks have arrived. This is already a one war. However, before it ends, we need to attack another country and capture a province from them. Oops, well, not anymore. I mean, I declare the war. I want you to understand my plan. It is to take all the provinces that do not belong to Punjab in this war, at least the majority of them, as there are quite a few. We will end the war with Delhi as follows. I'm taking these provinces. As you can see, I'm leaving only the ones that will belong to Punjab later. Well, except for these two. Here, I'll release a vassal from Delhi. Let it exist there. Plus, I have some money to repay our debt. And while I'm at it, oh, of course, I didn't prepare the diplomat, so with Chiba, it won't work. Okay, with Dihimi, we're taking two more privileges, namely increased taxes and autonomy. This way, I tolerate the Hindu religion, and as you know, I have 100% religious unity. I see, I should focus on administrative points. We will need a lot of them. I could have done it much earlier. As for the provinces we took from Delhi, we are coring only and exactly these three. We are making this culture almost our primary one. Almost. All right, so now we just need to improve upper dobe, maybe twice. That should be enough. This culture change will grant us the option to form Delhi after fulfilling the following requirements. So, I need to conquer this and this province from, oh, unfortunately Delhi. Yes! You see, Mughal has disappeared for now. That's why we will only conquer the provinces we need. No more. And then we will make our Afghan culture primary again. And that's when I will form the Mughal Empire. We need Delhi for this purpose because it has a lot of territorial claims related to Jaunpur, which will limit our aggressive expansion. Additionally, Delhi has better initial ideas, of course. And don't worry, at this moment, although I have already achieved this achievement, so it is not on this list, but the achievement should disappear from your list of possible achievements as well. However, when you switch back to the Afghan culture, it should become available to you. Let me know if that's the case for you. If you're following this guide, maybe this method works. It has been confirmed by people on my Discord so far. And I found a few threads on Reddit that confirm this as well. From what I see, Timur is having quite a lot of trouble. Currently, he is unable to quell his rebellion, so I think it's a good opportunity to attack him and reclaim our territorial claims. This war should be easy, I guess, especially since Timur is engaging my army without a general. The first government reform, and for those watching me, you probably won't be surprised. National taxation. I just don't have enough manpower. So I plan to rely on mercenaries throughout the entire campaign. It's really the easiest solution. When you lack manpower, hire mercenaries, especially before the year 1500 when they are the cheapest. Timur's capital falls after a quite long siege. I could call Transoxiana for assistance, but do I really need it? I don't think so. I just reached the fifth technology level and changed the type of our units. This should provoke Timur to abandon the fortress and chase our army. I'm ending the war as follows. I reclaim all our territories, demand war reparations, and humiliate them. I'm not taking any money because I had to call Transoxiana to this war to speed things up. After this war, I disband our free company. I'll probably hire a larger variant of it soon. I'm attacking Sindh, which won't shorten my peace period with Delhi, but it will allow me to break their alliance with Bengal, especially since they just lost their entire army. I conduct wars as follows. I try to siege down countries that are not my main target and take them out usually for money. If they are weak countries with no fortresses, I don't even bother breaking their strong alliances. For example, Jampur, which will be my next target. Now it's time for the fifth technology and choosing ideas. The standard build that is is often recommended and that I have used in the past is diplomatic and administrative ideas. 
although not necessarily in that order. Usually, people take administrative ideas first to reduce core creation cost as quickly as possible. Then they develop diplomatic ideas and somewhere in between. Whenever they have points, they take administrative ideas. Diplomatic ideas are mainly chosen for the province war score cost reduction of 20% to conquer more territory. However, when I played this game, I remember struggling with aggressive expansion. That's why I will utilize espionage ideas in combination with offensive ideas. First and foremost, I will benefit from the 20% reduction in aggressive expansion. Secondly, we gain the ability to transfer vassals. On the third idea, we get siege ability plus 10%, an additional diplomat, and more importantly, vassalization acceptance plus 15%, which is equivalent to having five points of diplomatic reputation. So there's nothing better than this. Additionally, we benefit from the passive strong favor growth modifier plus 33%, enabling us to call our allies for help more frequently. The reason for taking offensive ideas mainly lies in the siege ability plus 20%. We also increase our force limit and benefit from discipline. Having better generals is also highly desirable, and gaining prestige from battles will make it easier for us to maintain high prestige, which grants us various modifiers. Furthermore, the combination of diplomatic and offensive ideas grants grants us a policy that provides an additional diplomat and a 25% reduction in network construction cost. Thanks to this, we will be able to build spy networks faster in the appropriate countries. Remember that spy networks also reduce aggressive expansion and speed up sieges. So at this point, I am already developing my ideas. Unfortunately, I don't have the golden age to do it cheaply, but I can activate it when I have two ideas to develop at once. And at this point, we have a 45% reduction in aggressive expansion. All right, let's talk about the post-war situation with Sindh. A few years of rest and then the next war will likely be a direct one with Delhi. It's time to abdicate our ruler since the air is much better. Yes, it costs us a lot of prestige but it's alright. We want to add provinces with Afghan culture to our crownland as much as possible. Also, in one of these conquered provinces we want to develop the institution. Firstly, because you have cotton there, which reduces the development cost. Here you have drylands, so you have a small penalty to development costs. It's the most profitable region to develop. And remember, we have to change our culture back to Afghan before becoming Mughal. I'm annexing our tiny vassal. I'm also creating a new vassal, Punjab, at this moment, so the annexation timer starts ticking. It doesn't really affect our vassal's loyalty because I can activate the strong duchess ability. Yes, this war with Delhi is incredibly easy. We'll take the following peace deal with Delhi. Almost everything goes to Punjab, except for those two provinces that go to us. Unfortunately, they are left with only one province. It shows that in the previous war, I could have taken at least one province from them. Now, I would have taken all all of Delhi, but now I have to wait. Meanwhile, I have a good opportunity to conquer Multan because Jiangpur won't join this war now. I have other ways to break the truce with them. I introduced the Renaissance Institution in bulk. Yes, I also spent administrative points to increase our country's level to a kingdom, and the Renaissance will be embraced soon. Super! Our ruler just got a minus 10 aggressive expansion modifier. Great! Now I can finally choose the first idea from the era. Of course, it will be aggressive expansion, and we have a 60% reduction in it. I must admit, I'm seriously considering breaking the truce with Delhi because stupid Jiangpur guaranteed them, although it's just a two-year difference. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We will attack Sindh. I also have level two advisors everywhere and they are cheaper now. And I'm currently waging a war for Sindh, where Delhi will be called in. And separately, I might also start a war with Timur. Hmm, why isn't Mamluks helping? They have another war. Delhi disappears from the map. Finally, I don't even have to core that one province. Sikhs have appeared. I should do a campaign focused on that religion someday. I don't think I've ever played it before. I take the capital from Timur. Enough of besieging that fortress. I'm taking Indorostan, so it will become my vassal now. War reparations and some money. My war has grown a bit too big here. That's good because my war is a Hindu country and we can have as much aggressive expansion as we want with them. It's a bit trickier with Bahmanis and Bengal as we can't push them too hard right now. But I believe if I save my aggressive expansion for Jampur, I'll be able to pursue larger conquests later on. All right, we're forming the Sultanate of Delhi now. Yes, we want new ambitions and traditions because these are even better. We get core creation cost, Jarl army tradition, and stability bonuses. The initial ones are also nice and we continue with our coring. I can also integrate Punjab at a lower cost now. I could have shown you earlier how much much it cost before, but now the cost is decreased by about 400 points. Let's check it now. We can't form the Mughal Empire yet. We don't have the necessary requirement. But if we accept Afghan culture as our primary culture again, we can practically form the Mughal Empire immediately. I'll just revert it for now. Because this culture will be useful during the conquest of Jampur. It will speed up the coring process, as I don't really need the Afghan culture. Now I can create a few additional companies. That's great. I integrated Punjab quickly because most 
most of its land had already been fully cored, so I didn't have to annex them. The best part is that we can now attack Jampur and reclaim our national provinces, of which we have quite a few. Let's call Bengal to assist us. Calling Bengal was worth it. They are doing quite well against Jampur. Meanwhile, I'm taking Transoxiana's fort to reduce the amount of land to conquer here. I'm heavily indebting and burdening this country. I'm also breaking their alliance with Jampur. Let's see if they'll get a better one. All right, I'm maximizing corruption at this point. This campaign relies heavily on mercenaries, so we won't be gathering any professionalism. Finally, I can start the Golden Age, and that's what I'm doing. It will provide a series of incredible strong bonuses, but my main focus is to reduce the costs of everything using monarchy points. That's why I waited to continue developing developing the ideas, to make them cheaper, and also the seventh military technology. Though it's crucial because it gives us access to artillery, I'm retaking the following territories, basically all of them from what I can see, and gaining access to Malwa, which I intend to make our vassal. I'm not taking money either because this is a crucial moment in the campaign where land is much more valuable. I'm still coring some of the remaining provinces, that's why I'm not changing the culture and not creating a new state again. I'll do that right after forming the Mughal Empire. We absorbed our vassal, which allowed me to complete several missions. I'm taking them because we won't be Delhi for long, so there's no need to wait here. I'm also creating my new armies. Infantry and cavalry are mercenaries because we'll gain quite a bit of manpower through sieges. And for now, I'm adding four artillery units to the mix. Of course, I will gradually increase that number. A quick war to vassalize Malwa. And at the same time, we'll shorten the truce period with Jampur. I have four artillery units because it already gives us the second level of siege. Fortresses, then six, eight, and a maximum of 10. Regarding the second level fortresses, and great, I'm also taking some extra money and I'm reducing the truce period from 15 years to seven. Oh, they had much more to reclaim a moment ago. WTF? Well, never mind. Okay, regardless, I'm making the Afghan culture our primary culture again. And there you have it. Thanks to that, I can form the Mughal Empire, but even before that, I took control of a few more distant territories using our hard cores. This makes our country significantly richer. Before coring, we had 25 gold, now we have 40. We had 28,000 troops, but now I have 47,000. As you can see, there's practically no aggressive expansion with our neighbors, although Sunni countries are the main concern. Now the most challenging part is behind us, with a strong opening for conquering India. I'm also creating a regular army composed of manpower. It will consist of around 10,000 infantry, and 4,000 artillery. This army will primarily handle carpet sieging all the provinces. And now is the moment when I form the Mughal Empire. The most crucial thing is that we become an empire, which allows us to conquer more territories. And we want a new idea. Of course, Mughal ideas, because they are amazing for conquest. As you can see, we already have a core creation cost reduction of 25% at the beginning. In the end, we will have military technology, discipline bonus, a more stable country, and cheaper ideas. The downside is that unfortunately, our states will change and to be honest, I'm not very familiar with these Indian states. So if you have any suggestions or notice that I'm doing something wrong, please let me know in the comments. But of course, for Rajputs, I'm taking only those two privileges. They should be happy with that. As for the Brahmins, or however it's pronounced, the privileges are mainly focused on increasing religious tolerance and accelerating our domestic reforms, but mainly I'm focusing on religious tolerance. Oh, and for the Jains, it seems I have to take the diplomatic point. Ah, uh, I can take loans now. I just can't believe I didn't repay the previous ones. Yes, here they are. And the remaining privileges you see here are mainly small economic bonuses, like reducing corruption or increasing other modifiers. From what I can see, I currently have the following government reforms. Increased tolerance of heretics, the Mughal government, which provides increased governing capacity and tolerance for my primary faith. The third reform remains the same as we had before. And now I have the option to adopt the fourth reform, which is very important. Despite not converting any provinces, this reform is crucial because of one decision. This decision allows us to get rid of legalism for the cost of one stability point and fully embrace mysticism. This grants us a bit of manpower for free and the ability to make the second reverse reform, which will again cost one stability point and lead us back towards legalism. This is a very powerful mechanic. So since I know I will be paying for stability, I'll take the cost reduction for stability by 20%. Oh, I have the option to choose the fifth, sixth, and seventh reforms now. What happened? Why did I suddenly get so many reforms? What is this privilege reducing cavalry costs? And the sixth reform, to be honest, these two are very powerful. Both the fact that call diet doesn't increase the influence of our states again, and this reform that accelerates the reduction of aggressive expansion, are very powerful. I think I'll take this one. Mughals have a slightly different system related to culture. It's quite unique. All cultures are acceptable. 
and when we conquer a specific culture group, we receive certain bonuses. The Mughal idea tree is also very extensive. Moreover, as an empire, we already have a lot of territorial claims from the start. Time for the next advancement in the era. So I took the Riseward axes for free. These small countries, like the one you see here, are perfect for making white peace. They serve as excellent targets to reset truces with those big blobs. It may surprise you, but I'm moving my capital either to Kabul or Bal. The main reason is to be in the Persian region rather than the Indian region. This way, I'll be able to create create a trade company here. Of course, the states I already have will remain states. Only the new provinces will belong to the trade company. This will lead to a strong trade presence, mainly in Gujarat, Deccan, and Coromandel. Bengal will also serve as a significant trade center. It will allow us to accumulate a considerable number of administrative points and bypass the entire gathering problem. This will also allow us to earn enough money to hire mercenaries instead of maintaining a manpower-based army. In the meantime, I had a moment of peace, so I made Khorostan my march after capturing more provinces from it. Should I conquer Gujarat or turn it into a vassal? Although, maybe not. I won't release a vassal. It has too few provinces. But I'm lucky because Vijayanagar and Bahmanis are at war with each other. That's good because one of these countries will be our target soon, perhaps both at the same time. Just before we conquer territories from Jampur, in the next war with them, I'll take a province to remove all their forts and gain access to Bengal, Bahmanis, and our future targets. I'll only take a province and immediately start a war with Kham, something to reset the truces with Maiwar and Jampur. Since Vijayanagar is winning the war, War against Bamanis, I'll attack Vijayanagar. Meanwhile, I'll offer white peace to Vijayanagar's allies. Money is tight here. As you can see, my three diplomats are currently focused on our three main targets, Bamanis, Bengal, and Vijayanagar. Unfortunately, sometimes they get detected. Vijayanagar is quite substantial with 435 development and costs 100% war score. I can take about 70 points from them. There will be quite a few wars. I've released Mudarai as my vassal. It has a lot of territorial claims. The second phase of conquest is is going quite well so far. Most of these countries will be conquered in two, three wars. I still have 40 years, so things should be fine. I don't have to worry about any coalitions for now. Take a look. There's zero aggressive expansion with Timur. There's also no aggressive expansion with the Ottomans, with whom I also had a conflict. The only potential coalition member could be Bengal, but it's the only country. Even Bahmanis has only 28 points. Essentially, my further gameplay will focus on conquering Bahmanis, Vijayanagar, and Bengal. Every other remaining country will fall in just one war. My army also has a huge qualitative advantage. Honestly, conquering as the Muggles using these ideas and the strategy I presented here is much more enjoyable. However, I'm curious about your opinion. What do you think about it? Perhaps if I had chosen the standard diplomatic and administrative ideas instead of the ones I have, I would have finished conquering India around 20 years ago, with maybe one small coalition. But personally, I don't like coalitions, so I'm glad I took this idea because it's working out really well. India is a country with excellent production, and we have valuable resources to generate income and build up our trade. Therefore, I'm constructing numerous new workshops, this is the moment when I can recover all the expenses I previously had on the military. Now I'm going for the third cycle of conquests and this time I plan to eat up most of the allied nations. I'll also continue with our missions, although I must say that the general I got this time is quite weak compared to the better ones I have. We just received 500 gold, and the Age of Reformation has begun. In this age, the religious war is the first advancement we'll take, as it's crucial and powerful. Look at how many cultures we already accept, and we have one cultural group, giving us a bonus to cheaper coring. Oh no, there's a potential coalition forming. But from what I can see, Vijayanagar will be the only country involved. I will have to do a break truce with Vijayanagar in order to conquer all of India before the time runs out. From the Age abilities, I will definitely choose the one that reduces the province cost with a different religion. Although we now have very good artillery as Muggles, the fewer break truces, the better. Unfortunately, at this moment, there will be two. One with Bamanis and the other with Vijayanagar. Although I must say, I'm surprised at how much aggressive expansion I receive for breaking that truce. Oh well. But luckily, I won't need to do that with Vijayanagar, because it costs less than 50% war score, and in a moment, my truce with Ranatahapur will be over. So I didn't even have to attack Bamanis, because the previous truce ended in 45. The riches of Golconda. Well, let it be that way. I must honestly think hard about which ideas to choose next. If I were planning to play as a Sikh or Hindu nation, I would definitely go for expansion ideas without a second thought. With these ideas, we get a minimum autonomy in territories, a 10% reduction. Additionally, as a 
Dharmic religion nation, we have that powerful monument. A 15% reduction in autonomy in territories is a significant bonus. If I were to continue playing as the Muggles and focus on conquest, I would now go for administrative and diplomatic ideas to expand as quickly as possible. Then, as my third choice, I'd pick humanist ideas because they would help stabilize our country. They also complement well with espionage and offensive ideas. Another viable option could be taking humanist ideas now, followed by diplomatic and then administrative as the next group of ideas. And there it is, everything is conquered. Of course, they have two vassals, which I am currently annexing, but it fulfills the conditions for the achievement. We need to control all of India, and I even have a bit more, either through me or my vassals. I must say, it was incredibly easy and enjoyable compared to how difficult it used to be. Impossible? Not really, especially since I did it without diplomatic and administrative ideas, which are designed for the fastest expansion. If you want to do it all without coalitions, without manpower issues, and so on, then I highly recommend espionage and offensive ideas. Poland has the strongest cavalry in the world. Find out why in this episode.